so you, can you hear me okay from the mic all the way down there? All right, so I'm Adam. I'm a software engineer at Diagnotes, where we're building healthcare communication platform for people. It's very cool. Uh, we do Ruby there a little bit. Um, so my experience is pretty short with Ruby, about a year uh, just through work. But I've been using Emacs for about seven years or so, um, and wish I always, or I always wish that I had decided to go, go with a VI instead. But here I am, um, and I really do want people to like I don't know ask questions or challenge what I say. Um, if you've heard of the Strong Opinions Weekly Health thing, I don't believe in that. I believe in Weak Opinions Weekly Health. So. Um, I'm just enthusiastically weak, in my opinions. Um, so yeah, and by the way, I guess as far as Ruby and Emacs goes, um, I believe Matt, the author of Ruby, it, at least if he doesn't use Emacs, writes the Ruby mode for uh, the language, and so that's kind of a fun fact. So if the Ruby mode in Emacs doesn't format your code uh, how you like, then you're wrong, I guess. Um, so let's get to it. Oh, this is going to be a little bit fun. Can we still see that or not? It's just on this page, maybe. Whatever. All right, whatever. OK, Emacs, um, one second. I'll make it so you can see this at least. So, sorry about that. Uh, Emacs belongs to a family of text editors, um, and this distinction is becoming less and less relevant, but I think it's still significant uh, in the way we talk about Emacs and think about it. And what I mean by that is not strictly between like pure GNU Emacs or um, Aqua Emacs or Space Max, which are all sort of the same things, but also the lineage of what Emacs was is as it was introduced to the computing world and how different uh, hardware architectures um, developed different so like programs they called Emacs because it borrowed similar ideas from it like buffers um, and the kill ring um, and its configurability through being uh, a Lisp interpreter where things like VI we think of as pretty distinct by its modal um, editing paradigm. Um, but it's still more or less uh, VI. Uh, so that's really what distinguishes Emacs the most between the other editors is its extensibility. And to me, I think of Emacs as being um, more generic than the implementation and more about uh, being a program that allows every aspect of it to be changed and customized. Um, so some history. In uh, 1976, Guy Steele published the first version of Emacs. Um, which isn't really the, uh, what, the same program we see today, but it also ends up being the same year that Bill Joy um, introduces VI into Berkeley, uh, Berkeley Unix. And so Guy Steele, if uh, you're not familiar, is the author of Common Lisp. Um, Bill Joy uh, being uh, kind of responsible for BSD and a lot of what Unix is now today. Um, and so different programs developed around the same time to do very different things, or do the same thing, but in a very different way. Um, but GNU Emacs, which is, hasn't really changed since uh, 1985, uh, was written by uh, Richard Stallman and James Gosling, who, uh, and James Gosling is the author of, or creator of the Java programming language. So. A lot of significant people involved in text editors, I guess. Um, and then 1970 is when ED uh, is written by Ken Thompson. Ken Thompson. And uh, that's sort of, if you're not uh, familiar, kind of a staple of text editors to begin with, and this, like, the standard text editor of Unix. So I wanted to share a little bit about uh, that as well. Um, so, uh, text editing as a tool for thought is a phrase I came up with to describe like my passion for it, I think, and why it's important. Um, so Kenneth Iverson, 
is the author of APL, uh, which is a really um, amazing programming language in my opinion, and it's mostly like the stereotypical APL program is this implementation of Conway's Game of Life, uh, and this is a complete implementation. If you put this program in the, an APL interpreter, uh, it will print out to you like an ASCII matrix of a, a generation of life in any um, preset. You just have to figure out how to give it an input to this function. It's kind of uh, non-intuitive, but it's a very um, dense language APL, but it's quite cool uh, in my opinion. Um, and also, I believe that text is in fact the universal interface, um, and I think Emacs really embodies what that means, and to have that kind of expressiveness and um, like structureless uh, interface or editing environment. Um, and it's a little bit, my, I think the presentation is sort of bleeding onto the next slide, but um, Kenneth Iverson's paper that explains APL is called Notation for a Tool for Thought, so that's why I borrowed the, the name. So actually, what a, um, I think I can go back to here. All right, so it's a little bit. Um, Small still, or big. Is that still readable for most people? All right. Sorry. Okay. So, is are people familiar with line editing at all here? No. no. Totally new, perfect. Um, uh, how many people in the room use an editor besides Vim or Emacs? Most people. Who uh, uses Emacs by chance? Okay. This is good. This is good. So. Um, Line editing, really, I think the term comes from ED. So what is ED? It's a line-oriented text editor, and it was uh, designed before computers had screens. It was for teletypes, which was basically a typewriter connected to a computer. Uh, so you really were not able to view all of this text like I can in the terminal window at once. So you're restricted to editing lines um, like look, reading a single line at a time as a person and then editing specific lines uh, directly through commands, which is what Vim does. Um, and that's where, and Ed is essentially uh, behaves the same way. Um, and I think this is kind of funny with uh, here in the manual where it says, um, uh, this is the, Ed is the standard Unix or standard text editor in the sense that the original editor for, it was the original ed editor for Unix uh, but for most purposes, it is superseded by full screen editors such as GNU Emacs or GNU Mo. And I've never heard of GNU Mo, so I can only imagine they're looking for anything besides VI to put there. Um, <laughs> so, Ed is also uh, quite fun because it's one of these Unix programs that are so uh, confusing to exit. Nothing you think you know will work. Um, absolutely nothing. So, <laughs> luckily, I know how to exit it now for the <laughs> for the talk. But it's also a very um, familiar editor once you do understand the way it operates. So, if I open it up, I can ask it to insert a new line. This is a new line. End the line. Print it out. Um, add another line, I guess. This is some more stuff. Um, and print that out and stuff. So this actually is the same principle as the dot command in VI, where it keeps track of the last um, action, or cursor is what Ed, or ED calls it. Um, so to print the whole file, you actually can shortcut that with comma P, uh, which is print all of uh, the file it can. And then we can do familiar things, like I said. So if we wanted to change um, 
on line one, new with other text, and then print that out. That's what it's sort of familiar. Or um, it's a little bit funny to see the screen here. So, so this is our file now. Um, we can delete the second line. Um, so kind of what we're familiar with VI, but this is happening on individual lines. So that's why it's called the line editor. And of course, um, we can save the file by giving it a name. And then uh, now we can exit with Q. So there we are. Um, but really, I think what, where line editing has become a bigger um, daily like driver for me is when I'm on the command line, where Bash actually is a full uh, tech, uh, line editor itself. Um, and that's because of ReadLine, which is a GNU library for reading in the current line of text um, on the command line and manipulating it. Uh, and it has one of my favorite bugs uh, that's documented, and it's too big and too slow. <laughs> but it does some extremely uh, impressive things, which I will demonstrate uh, in a minute. Um, but why I think line editing is important is because we only work with text one line at a time. Um, so let's make it as natural to manipulate as possible. Uh, and line editing helps eliminate the friction involved with getting our thoughts to the screen by leveraging muscle memory. And transforming text as we type means we can iterate on our ideas in real time, which provokes, uh, provokes us to think deeper about the problem at hand and inspire new ideas. And this is what Kenneth Iverson really writes about uh, in, with his paper on APL and how by jamming a whole bunch of operations into a single symbol in a programming language helps our brains as humans function a lot more efficiently and with more confidence or fluency over what we're doing because we can fit more in some symbol on the screen and we can then remember entire programs if they're only a few characters long and it's uh, fun. So for the same reasons I think uh, readline is cool. So. Um, did you know that on the command line you can copy and paste and uppercase, downcase words, uh, and even write macros? Probably not. And undo. Undo is a good one. So you can. Um, and so we can pretend this is a command with arguments. Um, and so the first, like basic navigation things is like go to the beginning of line, go to the end of line. Go backwards, forwards, backwards, forward words. And so, yeah, question? No, oh. No, sorry. That's okay. Okay. All right. So the read line key bindings are the same as the Emacs key bindings. So end of the line is control E, control A is beginning of line, control F is forward one character, control B is backwards one character. Meta F is forward a word, meta back, or meta B is back a word. Um, and this is also what Unix originally decided as being keyboard shortcuts, more or less. Um, but just through adapting readline into your workflow is, is kind of nice. Or what learning Emacs does is also give you this power. So you can leverage a lot of um, neat stuff this way. But uh, that's not that exciting. But it's kind of exciting um, to copy and paste around in the shell. Um, um, for like for navigation, control and holding down control and then F for forward, B for backward, A for beginning, and E for end. Um, meta is going to depend on your keyboard, so it's usually Alt. Yeah, um, and then you get to have some more um, fun with other commands later on. <laughs> um, so, he, which, and this is like some of it, um, like the undo is shift control, or yeah, control underscore, which is shift and control and hyphen, and that's so awkward, it's like, no, you're not going to do that, but it's there and you can look it up and whatever, but uh, actually I'll do it this way. So pretend um, I'm writing a function called set foo bar, and then I want to make, oops, got to be fine, it's not an editor. Um, 
So another thing, I think the uppercase thing is cool where control, um, oh, I have to be in bash here. Um, so meta, so alt and c will capitalize words. Um, alt and l will lowercase them. Alt and u will uppercase them completely. Um, I don't know, that's just like kind of line editing. And if I had like a function set foo bar, and as I'm writing it, I come up with an order of arguments, and I'm like, that doesn't really make sense. Well, you can also flip them. Um, and that's with transpose, and that's meta t for words. Or if you're mistyping things often, you can actually, um, oops, switch them with control t to transpose characters. Um, so that's kind of what line editing is and where key bindings end up being useful. Um, if you're thinking in terms of modal editing like Vim, and especially if you're not using that at all, where Emacs actually shares more of an interface with like a traditional uh, editor like Visual Studio um, or like your email client, but it doesn't expose um, as much control over your um, line, your capabilities on the line. So as an aside here in this talk, I think uh, you should also learn to type. That'll be a bigger advantage to you in the long run on a computer than learning an editor. Um, and I stand by this. If you're really serious, you should learn Dvorak. Um, and, and that's because that I think it's to force yourself to really learn typing, you might need to learn a different layout uh, to break all your bad habits. And Dvorak happens to be more comfortable, in my opinion, to type on, because uh, it was designed to be more comfortable. And it also has some coincidental uh, benefits of having the home row be most of the read line shortcuts. So things that are really awkward otherwise become all pretty convenient. Um, and my keyboard at work is an ErgoDox. And I think it's important to invest in your tooling this way as well, because now it's like, I don't even need Emacs in my life. I have my keyboard programmed to be behave like Emacs if I want. Like all the keys do what I want because it's a fully programmable keyboard. So um, it's like I can have like eight shift keys. So wherever my hand is or my mind is, I can just shift and move, make, make a letter that I want. Or I don't need to hold down shift to do parentheses. I can just type them. I can have the arrow keys anywhere I want. And it's just like kind of, if you're going to go down the road of Emacs, which is an enormous time investment, I'd encourage you to just instead learn to type and get a keyboard that you can program. Um, but what does make Emacs different? The extensibility, uh, and I want to show you this in a moment, the level of extensibility is unmatched. Um, and from that, the efficiency you get is, is quite powerful. And the consistency and transparency, I don't haven't seen in any other software. Um, where what I mean by transparency is I can ask Emacs, hey, what does this keyboard shortcut do? And then where is the source code for that? Can I change it? Yes. And I can do that actually without writing code. It's very transparent. People talk about the Vim uh, like help doc stuff. And that, that's kind of OK. Like It's kind of the same. It explains what it's doing, but it doesn't really show you the same way. And I can ask the same things like, hey, what uh, font style is, is this that I'm, my cursor is over? Um, or um, how does this work? Is this very transparent and consistent in the interface? So I can learn the way Emacs fundamentally behaves and that I can expect that to be the same way Emacs behaves in a different mode, either in an email mode, a web browser mode, a like, YAML configuration mode, or uh, like JavaScript mode. All the keyboard shortcuts should do semantically the same thing, and Emacs understands the semantics. Um, it's very consistent. The kill ring, infinite undo redo isn't such a big deal now, but Emacs always had it. Because um, why not? That's what you should be. You should have access to in an editor. Um, marking, which is what Emacs calls uh, selection, it's a lot more sophisticated. Um, it's not just about holding shift and using the arrow keys or using the mouse and dragging. It's a, you can explicitly mark a selection, search for somewhere else. It, Vim probably wins in this uh, this way, but 
Emacs is pretty natural. Um, Vim's visual mode I find confusing. Um, buffers and frames. Uh, so I can split this down like forever the way Vim can, but buffers are slightly more powerful in Emacs because um, everything is just held in memory. And so the notion of your projects or files doesn't matter anymore. You can just switch between them and the context will come with the buffer. Uh, it, I wish it was easier to demonstrate, but it lets you think in a workspace that doesn't have tabs or other UI elements. Everything is just there and I can switch to it um, without worrying about where projects are um, and waiting for like different instances of JetBrains to load and whatever. Um, so what do, what do those things get you? Kind of what I talked about. Emacs understands the semantic meaning of the text in my buffer, so if I'm uh, taking notes for myself, I can navigate between words and paragraphs and lists items, um, and if I'm in code, I can move between arguments, function blocks, the things you expect in a, in a text editor, um, but Emacs did this from uh, the 80s at the very least. Um, Emacs has every feature you can imagine, but it'll never surprise or distract you with them. Uh, I think this is more subtle than it appears, but I'm not, um, I'm able to go out and bring in a third party package to support a different language, but I'm not going to be um, like interrupted by it. Some of this is changing, um, but for the most part, you're in control and it'll behave the same way it behaved um, 40 years ago and 40 years from now. Uh, and I think uh, more than anything else, Emacs is useful beyond programming. Um, and that's probably its most powerful feature. Complete consistency between all operations on a computer. Your email, your web browsing, if you choose to do that, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, and your code editing or authoring, uh, your version control, everything operates together and believes to operate in the same way. So you get what you used to get um, on Mac OS pre, like, uh, I don't know, version like 10, and then you get what you might have had in Windows pre uh, Windows 10. So uh, I don't, I don't, you get a consistency in your and in your in your environment you don't really see anymore. You get total like fluency with with the machine. Um, oops, I don't even know if I meant to exit that. Nope. Uh, so I'm running this presentation through uh, Emacs just as an experiment for myself. I don't actually. I, um, I don't think it's the best way to do it, but it's been fun. So uh, the killer features, if you've heard of these, org mode, magic, and tramp. Uh, so I, I had to not call tramp the best way to edit remote files because it's not, just so you believe me that magic and org mode are the best in the world, they're world class. Uh, Features. Um, has anyone heard of org mode here? A few. Um, have you uh, tried it or what brought you to it? Uh, I played with it a little bit. It seems very well structured and helpful if you're running a project or you're just tracking anything. So there's a little bit of that. Okay. Yeah. It's a big investment in Emacs to get to org mode, which is why I think we, it's not as popular. Um, but yeah, it's extremely sophisticated and very uh, impressive, it, not just for, it has its own system. If you're familiar with Pandoc, it can export to any file type imaginable, uh, PDFs, websites. It understands LaTeX extremely well, so it can manage all of your bibli like bibliography references and. Uh, I can demonstrate a couple cool things, but it really is best in class. Um, knows how to schedule reminders and keep track of what you're working on. Uh, in Magic, it's really cool. I'm not usually one for interfaces, but it's like a really pleasant uh, textual interface on top of Git that just utilizes the command line you already know, um, but presents information a lot more visually and kind of just does what you imagined things to do. Uh, and Tramp is cool, I'll show that first because it's fastest, but the argument against Emacs is usually um, about editing on remote machines, and my response, or the Emacs community's response is, why are you opening an editor on a remote machine? Just open it on your machine remotely. Um, and so that's what Tramp does, and so the way that is, 
convenient to show that is with Docker. So um, I'm just going to run bash here in a Docker container and go into opt and get a quick file going. File. And if we go over here to Emacs, I think we have to like bounce out of the presentation for a second. So what I'll do is move this over. Okay. Go side by side here. So you probably can't see it from the bottom because it won't let me um, change the font down there. But I'm going to open up an Emacs window into this running Docker container. And that will give you an example of um, kind of that it can open any remote system directory. Sometimes it doesn't like me. and F foobar now there is more save it hello <laughs> There it is. I don't know why tail wasn't working, but um, so what this is doing is opening uh, a copy, a buffered copy of this file, and I can edit that remotely. So I'm not actually live updating the file descriptor on the remote machine, but when I save it, it like SCPs it back. Um, so it's a little more intelligent than one could edit remote files, and it does it well. So I don't know. I thought this was cool. It's kind of a gimmick because like I don't think there really is a use case for jumping into a Docker file system. Usually it's just running a service, but it, it's a cool uh, demo, I think. Um, and so I guess actually before going through org mode or Magit or whatever people might want to see, um, I wanted to give some closing thoughts. Uh, and this is just kind of what I ask myself a lot. And, keep coming back to Emacs because I think there's a lot of uh, sunk cost at this point, but it's also what I find to be really fun. So um, what what you find fun is probably more worth your time than things you don't find fun. So just because I think Emacs is really cool or VI is worth your time, don't necessarily uh, force yourself if you're not under, like enjoying it. Um, uh, so okay. So what uh, what do our tools impose? Where, where do our tools impose limitations on us? Um, and what limitations do we actually want? Those aren't necessarily the same. Um, I think an iPhone is a great example of this. The iPhone imposes a lot of limitations on you as a user, um, but for me, those are exactly the limitations I'm looking for in a phone. I'm not looking um, to really like tweak the kernel of my smartphone that I do banking with and messaging with. Um, so. I think you can ask the same about Visual Studio and Emacs or VI. What limitations do you want from your tools and what limitations are your tools giving you? Um, what are the constraints of your environment um, and how are you investing in your tools? Uh, what are the trade-offs? Um, if, if you're not thinking through the trade-offs, you might be missing out on some good learning. 
and uh, you might be wasting a lot of time if, if you don't revisit the trade-offs. Um, example for me is that, um, well, I don't know. I have, I've been a little bit um, adverse to acknowledging some trade-offs, but I've decided to make Emacs work uh, professionally for me, where my coworkers are, gonna, are using JetBrains, because for them, that's the better trade-off. Uh, and they, they'll never like want to get Emacs or VI to a place that can do nearly as good a job at managing large projects in, of source code. Um, and they want to lean on JetBrains. And I think that's, for most of the time, the right way to go uh, professionally. Um, so, I don't know, I guess before going to do more demos and how we are on time, does anyone have a like, reaction to either these questions or other things I've talked about so far? It's fine if you don't. I have a slightly unrelated question. What window manager are you using? Um, this is XFCE. Is there a cool way to show the mouse? <laughs> and it's like kind of a borked installation of Debian Stable um, at the moment, but another, yeah. Um, no surprises from XFCE usually, very consist consistent. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, let's see. I do have a couple co cool quotes that are tangential to the talk as well. And yeah, we don't have to say thanks yet. No questions. So another time to resize font. So a couple quotes. This one's by Fred Brooks. Um, Show me your flowcharts and conceal your tables, and I shall continue to be mystified. Show me your tables, and I won't usually need your flowcharts. They'll be obvious. Um, also, I think more subtle than it appears, this quote comes up often um, in software engineering. And I think text editors do a good job at embodying the true spirit of this. Um, it's not uh, not concealing functionality from you, and it, because with, like oh, here's a good way. Well, I think this goes back to text being a universal interface um, that you can really leverage to do a lot more than you would otherwise, and it's because the structure you're presented in a traditional editor, like Visual Studio, is behind, is predetermined by the person writing these features or code analysis or refactoring tools. And the text you're looking at on your screen isn't really what you're editing. You're kind of like working around the structure you're given. Um, but when your text is the structure, when your code is the data itself, it just becomes extremely, like just much more powerful. Extremely powerful. Um, so, and this is uh, Kenneth Iverson again from that uh, paper in Notation as a Tool for Thought. Uh, the utility of a language as a tool for thought, a tool of thought, increases with the range of topics it can treat, but decreases with the amount of vocabulary and the complexity of grammatical rules which the user must keep in mind. Economy of notation is therefore important. This is um, Emacs clearly loses to Vim under this dichotomy. Uh, it, it's far more complex in vocabulary, Emacs is, and the utility in general use is about uh, about the same, I think. So Vim is designed a lot more like Iverson's APL is, where there's a small language and grammar, and it can do an enormous amount of manipulation with text. Where Emacs kind of comes, like if you're looking at a learning curve or whatever, it's kind of funny to look at them on the internet about Emacs and Vim because Vim is like just like a constant bar at the top of the graph and Emacs is just like doing a loop-de-loop -loop spiral or whatever and it's like kind of worse than that in reality because once you get through like you have to really go loop around a few times and then it's like the block like you have a infinite like momentum change and you're like all the way up at the top or whatever. like there's just sort of even too much uh, that you can do uh, like almost no limitations but it is consistent uh, in in that, uh, so I don't know. A couple other cool things. Um, yeah, I would. I don't mind. I would love to demonstrate more of actual Emacs to you. But um, I'm Adam again, and you can find this talk on GitHub, uh, and you can be you can email me there. I can make this bigger again.
Uh, so I don't know if this is formally over or not yet, but we can do, we can make it a over yeah, that's first. Up to you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's up to you. I actually have, if you don't mind, a question Please. for uh, similar to your kind of opening question, slightly different. Mm -hmm. Who has either attempted or at one point used Emacs and or Vim and does not any longer? Um, for those of you uh, that just raised their hand, do you use modal editing in the tool you use now? Use what? Um, do you use modal editing in the tool you use now, if you used to use uh, VI? So do you use like a kind of a Vim emulator? Sure, yeah. Kind of mode, mode, uh, in your new yeah. I, I have on and off, but my, my, my reason is that like I was really admiring how, how totally bought in you were. You got keyboard, you got more acrobat, and when you are you are like mind melting with your machine. I'm sure you are. But then if you have to go touch something else, then it's like oh my god, I don't want to touch this thing. And that's where I was when when I got reasonably proficient with them. That wasn't available to me everywhere. You make efforts to make it available for you, but it just it just wasn't, and that just broke me. That's what kind of there, there are definitely times I've been said, I got to leave back. You gotta be the I started teaching, and I, of course I wasn't gonna subject them to, to them when they were. <laughs> Thank you for that. Computers in some cases. Um, but I thought to do that, I've got to really learn whatever, whatever I am teaching, so I better start using it every day. No, I just got a couple of those, and that's for the Vim modes, and so the IPS code. They're always incomplete, and I always tell myself, if I'm doing the mode switching and so on, but I'm going to be able to say colon percent s in a certain place, and that does not work. So the whole thing just falls apart. Cool. Sorry. Totally yeah, no, cool. Flow. That's fine. I don't. My flow is. Um, We'll see. Recharging. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess if people are curious in seeing what um, kinds of things you get from org mode uh, in that kind of integration in an editor, I can demonstrate briefly uh, what that might look like and might see how how we get, um, and then definitely. Yeah, any kinds of questions or it, for for those of you that um, I don't know are just curious about like VI and Emacs as these things like topics that are will come up across any kind of conversation um, about programming online. I'd just say uh, start. I don't know, mess around however you want, but go go learn some VI first. <laughs> or, or like, give do Emacs like a the kind of the history of Emacs makes it a little less like um, worth it until you really devote time to it. Um, and I think there's a lot of resources now that you can pull down like a really heavily configured instance of Emacs that's more like uh, run by a community. Uh, I think Doom Emacs is one, and Space Max is one particularly for uh, Vim users. And that is probably the way to go now, although I still like to recommend just configuring as you go. Um, so I can, I mean, that's a good place to start uh, with things. Um, so my Emacs configuration actually is an org mode document. So a totally plain text tool that I can publish, actually let's just publish it. I'm gonna publish this as a LaTeX uh, file and open it as a PDF here, it might take a second. Um, so everything that I have Emacs doing, including uh, the theme which I wrote, edited, or I don't know, created myself, is defined in this file and I just asked org mode to publish it to me. Um, so if we step through, I don't know how, this is probably a pretty big document. Um, and so I'll go through like installing Emacs on different operating systems and all of these code blocks uh, Emacs understands, or org mode can tell Emacs, actually these are, this is an Emacs file, 
or Emacs config file, I actually evaluate all of this code into Emacs as you start up, and that's how I get my environment. Um, so I have some fun pieces in here, but mostly it's just uh, kind of gives you a like a glimpse at what org mode might be able to do for you. Um, and if you're familiar with Jupyter Notebooks or IPython, it behaves very similarly. Um, so if I go back to the scratch here, uh, this is org. So I can tell org to use the shell language and tell me the date and execute it, and there it is. And so I can actually, I don't know the syntax offhand, but I can tell it to execute on a remote machine through my SSH config directory. Um, and this is for people that are into literative, or I don't, yeah, uh, literative programming or, um, I don't know, DevOps I think particularly is good here because you can explain what you're doing as you do it and kind of keep that document safe. What I end up doing, like for taking notes, I just, I'm usually in the shell. Um, I haven't found Emacs to be good enough at being a terminal emulator for me. So I usually am in the shell totally or to have over to Emacs. And if for something like with org mode, I'll just be doing my commands in the shell and just bring them over here if I want to. I'm not quite as invested in being purely in Emacs, but I can like open a shell and it's all good. Um, and I can compile programs, but I usually don't. Um, let's kill it and go here. So back to a readme file. Um, I don't know. So we actually don't need to. We already looked at this. Um, so let's do another example. So uh, Emacs is good at, or org mode is good at to-dos. So to give it a headline stuff. Or no. Let's see. Fig, take a look at um, scan.go, I guess. Make that a to-do item. And I'm going to tell, I don't remember the shortcut, so I'll just tell org to clock in. And that's going to record what I start doing. And now I'm going to go and pull up. Um, I did prepare slightly with copying the, Go, the Golang source code into my desktop. Um, and open up scan.go. And I know I'm looking for panic here. If I can type. And there, that's what I want. So let's pretend I'm interested. Not here, right? Actually, let's go more interesting. Let's look at here. Um, I, you know, pretend I'm interested in this uh, line here. And let's say instead of panic E, it was return or something. Um, this might even say this is wrong, but I guess we're okay. No, so we, I just introduced a bug. So um, let's say my to do list is this. I end up, oh, that doesn't look right. Org store link back here. Um, over here, it's sorry, hard to see, but it um, org kind of remembers that. What is it doing? <laughs> here we are. Got a couple windows up, but uh, this looks like it should panic. Uh, or I don't know, that might have been confusing, but this is actually a link over to that source file, hopefully. <laughs> I can see it. Let's try again. Um, so what I was going to do is tell org mode to store the location of this file at this line. And then over in my document, I was going to tell it um, to link there. So here this is better. So um, then I can maybe make a note. This uh, doesn't look right or something, I don't know. Come back to it later. Now I can open it. It's sort of confused, it looks like, where this file was, but... Um, let's just pretend it was over and link me to the right place. 
<laughs> but it should. <laughs> um, and that's, I don't know, kind of fun to see what, now I can say, well, now uh, I, can, I canceled this task because it didn't make sense anymore. Um, org mode can keep track of that. Um, I might make this slightly smaller now. Okay. Uh, but what is happening here? Okay. Um, but other things org mode understands. Um, so like headings, subheadings, other sub, other. Um, and so it understands how to like move headings around, which um, item, thing, foobar, like knows how to move. Like sometimes this is like already so useful uh, to move your thoughts around that in this way um, and demote or promote them. Uh, and also like, oh, actually I don't like um, hyphens, I'd rather do pluses or stars or numbers or those numbers. Like it just kind of gives you a, a sense for um, text editing over going to a menu and clicking change to this or like having to get your mouse out and select and change and uh, all of that obnoxious kind of behavior. Um, and I, back to scan, we can do, so like here, I have pretty minimal syntax highlighting on, it's, you're looking at everything, um, built-ins are bold, comments are light gray, and then everything else is the same, but if that's not uh, your style, you can ask um, Emacs to ask, tell you what, um, what the heck, tell you what, um, styling you're looking at. So I just asked Emacs to describe face <coughs> on this comment line. Now I'm getting a menu. Oh, it's telling me what it is. It's a foreground of 5C, 5C, 5C. And I'm like, oh, what's that? Well, I can turn on rainbow mode, which will now treat this buffer looking for anything that looks like a hex code. And so now I can get a sense of what 5C, 5C, 5C looks like. Or I can go ahead and customize it, um, add some italics, change the foreground, uh, to something more interesting and then apply it. Um, and I mean, yeah, like now a day is, I guess, not so exciting. Uh, you could probably figure out how to do that or just not even worry about it. Um, but let's see, let's pretend this was a JavaScript file. That's fun. It's really not going to like that. Uh, and JavaScript is cool because you have a lot of ways of representing strings. So const stir equals something here. And so I've defined a function that lets me toggle between string types in programming languages in Emacs with Emacs Lisp. Um, and it's aware of the mode. So I don't know, you can kind of see it switching around. Um, and actually, go back to Go mode here. Go is kind of, it doesn't let you do single quotes, but it, it still has, um, I don't know if this will even work. Var foo equals something here. It knows backticks um, as like a string literal. so. It kind of, it will, this will, my function will adapt to the mode, but I, if I don't know what that was doing, or if that was like a built-in function, um, I can ask Emacs to, to describe a function. I'm sorry, it's really small down at the, I can do this really horrible thing you're going to wish I didn't do for you. <laughs> um, to see, woo, all right. I'm going to ask it what my uh, toggle quotes function is, and it's going to tell me it's a function bound to control C uh, a quote. I can make that a little bigger. And it's actually defined in my readme file. So I can open it and it'll take me right to my readme file we were just looking at um, to the definition of my uh, Emacs Lisp 
source that defines the function. And so here I just say um, ask Emacs to um, where do I ask it to get me the mode? Syntax, I think it's this. You can just look up how to do it and you, what you need from Emacs itself. But I can ask it what in the mode I'm in are quote characters. And so, um, actually I defined it in this function. So here it is. I'm defining what quotes I want to be able to cycle through. And then if I support them, I can toggle them. And it's, I don't know, kind of looks weirder than than it should be. There's some more elements of it, but I um, was thinking there would be a better way to demonstrate something fun, but um, I guess like with the, you kind of see it better just with that, um, uh, changing the font color for the comment. You can just on the fly change whatever you want and let, and ask Emacs how is this defined and I can save it for later if I want. Um, and I don't know, I guess that's all I can come up with on the top of my head. Uh, something kind of cool is this, is that Emacs has uh, a lot of, I don't know, a lot of solutions to what you might think. Like I wonder how if I could, um, oh, here's, here we go. So how many people, when they're writing code, end up with a lot of spaces or lines that have like a lot of space in between. I don't know how to ask this, but it's like you'll just constantly be like moving line, like white space around. Well, Emacs just decided to bind control space to just give me one space, please. And that I was like, oh, they thought of this brilliant thing, and I just have constantly like, wasted hours of my life moving white space back and forth. And if you weren't, it, like, it's not such a big deal on its own, but when, even if this, like, the, the quotes thing I just made up for myself, where I'm like, I'm sick and tired of deleting a double quote, making a single quote, because now I decided to change something. And so, uh, so kind of cool with that, if I have a string that is, um, this is, uh, let's see. This is actually, <laughs> um, sorry. Yeah. I was hoping, I'm hoping this example works. Sparta. So I had to escape, this might get mad at me. I'm trying to escape the quotes. Um, I don't know what it doesn't want about. This was sort of the problem with editing random source code. Let's go back to scratch here. Um, change this to JavaScript. Monster is um, this is my I guess the real the more common thing is to have double quotes um, don't do this and now if I toggle quotes it's also going to escape the characters for me then or quote characters that need to be escaped so this is where it gets kind of more annoying. If you want to change, usually I'm doing this and I'm like, oh, I want this. So uh, it kind of like, immedi it's immediately rewarding to just go and write the ELO function even if it takes you like an hour to figure out finally how to do it. Because now everywhere I'm going to be more intru like, um, or yeah, more excited to manipulate like make my code more clear to read if it's that easy to go um, oops, go from that to this. Um, is, I think the real question you know, is which would you do in this? <laughs> in this situation? What? What a JavaScript people would do? What or what no, I do? What you specifically prefer in this? I just need to know that. That's all. I just need to know. I'd probably leave it like this. Right. Yeah. Um, I actually, yeah, never mind. I don't want to get into single quoted strings. When I smart quote, once I, <laughs> I, I love, I love searching with smart quotes. 
Sorry, what? I was just I once had another programmer just look at me and say, double quotes are stupid. And yeah. so I just have to, I oh, like to ask. Just to, just to thank you. About thank you. Yeah. Your quotes in general. I just need to know. Um, right. So, right, exactly. And here's a, so for, um, for JavaScript in particular, I know like snippets are really popular um, and they're kind of useful sometimes. It's the same idea. I just have snippets under, um, prefixed with eight and then it'll, it's not really about jest, but I usually do like describe and write a function. So, Emacs just will have, so you can get uh, like whatever template snippet package you want, Emacs can just do it, you can just tell it to, um, we can just do it right now actually. Define a macro that means describe, or I don't know, we didn't do describe, we just did something with quotes, comma, there, um, semicolon, defined it, and I actually defined, like defined the macro with the typo, but I can just execute that here. Who it's gonna? That's a kind of, that was a funny bug actually. Um, and I can I don't usually do this more than one occurrence of it. Um, like I usually just define a macro to do it there, but you can just tell Emacs to save that macro, give it a name, and it'll store it somewhere, and you can recall it later. So that's kind of like what this just thing is. Um, so I can do it. Um, I have one for Go that's just for if error not equal nil, but I have to be in the go mode. Um, I have more sophisticated ones for lot tech. Let's try it. Uh, actually, do a Ruby one app. Or mode. <laughs> I don't even use. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, you know, all I need with Ruby is C tags. <laughs> I'll be honest. You just don't need any macros. Just, you don't even. You can, the language is a macro. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I have this. I can give a title. New title. And it'll pull in some stuff. I don't know. Like the usual things you expect to get, you kind of have. And on top of that, I can um, take advantage of the typing skills that I've developed and comfort in these sorts of text manipulations and use it for composing other documents. Um, I find just like the capitalization stuff pretty useful. Um, this is um, sentence, and I'd be like, oh, that should be capitalized. Um, and then actually, my f if anyone's not familiar with Emmet and they write HTML, you should look it up. Um, it's kind of funny with the font, their screen bigger. So Emmet, I think that's it. Yeah, look this up. It's uh, really cool. But this is what I tried to do, but it was too big. So I can ask Emmet to give me lorem ipsum, and now it's like a big thing on a line. Emacs is very much about 80 character widths, so um, control Q or uh, actually MetaQ is going to split it on 80 widths. And that's actually why if you write Python, the reason the doc strings look really goofy in Python sometimes, it's like something like this. No, it has like this is my doc string. Like there's some, like some old school Python documents look like that. It's because here, actually we'll do it this way. I'll show you my point. Um, There, this is what I'm talking about. This always annoyed me looking at Python. It's like, put the freaking quotes on the other line. Put it, like, do this. Why doesn't everything do this? In Python style guide, one of the pep eight things, it's like, you shall let Emacs format your 80 with column doc strings. Um, so, because yeah, it's way easier if everyone just has that same reason why all these auto linter formatting tools are finally like standard now because you shouldn't have to. Uh, deal with that, Just let the editor do it. Um, oh yeah, spell check is pretty cool. Vim does a lot of really good things out of the box too, like spell check, um, but now you don't have, these are Latin words, so it's kind of goofy, but. <laughs> so because it's wrong, um, uh, moving on in this sentence, 
but um, I can just go near the word and do control dot, it'll correct it for me. Sense, sense, <coughs> sentence. Um, so, I mean, same mechanism Vim has, but it's a little less convenient in Vim. You have to, like, choose the word, uh, but it's uh, built in. Completion is, is the, it's as there as you want. Like, this is sort of the phenomenon that I don't agree with and on them. All right, now talk is over, and I'm just talking. Um, on Slack, I get into where people start looking, or like, I want to learn Vim because all of this really cool autocomplete and the terminal is really cool and I want to be a hacker and I want to learn all this stuff because it's so exciting to me. And it's like, please do that. But that, but also know, like for those of you maybe that are in the profession more deeply, like don't think that's what you should always be looking for, I guess. Um, and so if you want a tool that understands really the structure of your project, use Visual Studio. Like, use JetBrains. And if that's what you want, use the tool design to do that. Um, and the stuff like the language server, kind of movement of making it less transparent in your text editor, I don't strictly um, relate to, I guess, or I don't. And that's kind of the reality now, where to get all this really cool IntelliSense features, you kind of give up you have to run some process in the background that's reading your buffer, your, your file, and doing stuff and throwing information on the screen and presenting like lines and pop-ups and all this stuff, which is great, but you're losing a lot of the essence of what text editing can be. And especially from, like, from Vim, which is just so good at letting you say, oh, let me just totally refactor this text on the screen. Um, just through whatever reg regular expression magic you have, like you, you lose a lot of that, or you, you're less inclined to really understand the power you have, I guess. Um, and, and it's not like the, yeah, I don't mean to say like you shouldn't be in the terminal using Vim, but know that you're giving, uh, you're making a lot of trade offs by not using a graphical program designed to display images, text, PDF, everything, which I was just able to show you open a PDF in Emacs. It's like, and then someone's like, oh, how do I open a PDF in a terminal? No, don't do that. Like, that's not meant for that. Um, or do it, and it's going to be a really fun thing. It'll get you to top of Hacker News. But, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but, yeah, I'm really, like I said, enthusiastic about uh, opinions I have. Weak opinions, weakly held, change my mind all the time. Um, I don't like the strong opinions, weakly held thing. I think that's kind of bad management practice. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I don't know. I, I like this stuff. Thanks, yeah.